All right, um, so today, uh, there's a lot of things going on today. It's Resurrection Sunday, and it's also, uh, we've reached a point in our teaching series that we've been in for a long time. So if you're part of Door of Hope, you've been here. Uh, we've been, we're right in the middle of this series, uh, exploring what the word God means to a Christian, to a follower of Jesus, because the word God is uh, actually quite an unhelpful, unclear word, and a lot of different people mean a lot of different kinds of things when they use that word God. And so we're taking three months to explore the character and the identity of the Christian God and what we mean when we say that word as Christians. And we're discovering that, that the word God for a Christian is Jesus-centered. And the God that Jesus reveals to us is a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God, who is all three in perfect unity and harmony. And so we're, uh, we've been in this part exploring God the Son, and today we're exploring Jesus as uh, the Son of God, the risen, the risen King, because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Uh, that's great. <laughs> so so um, that's, what we're, uh, that's what we're doing today. So I encourage you, uh, grab a Bible. Uh, if you have one, and uh, open it up to the New Testament, to uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, the book of Romans. And we're just going to look at the first sentences of Paul's letter to the Romans today. If you don't have a, a Bible, um, we're going to have some of the key passages right up here on the screen as well. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Now, just, sorry, I, can't, I can never get very far before I start, start talking. So, so remember, that is, uh, is Christ Jesus' uh, last name? It's not. No Mary Christ, right? Or Joseph Christ. So it's a title. It's a Jewish title that means anointed, uh, royal, messianic king. So say king or messiah in, in your minds when you, when you read that. So Paul, a servant of Messiah, Jesus, called to be an apostle, which is a, a commissioned herald and announcer, and set apart for the gospel of God, or the good news that is of God. So this is uh, Paul's letter. We spent uh, a whole part of our last fall as a community studying another one of Paul's letters uh, to the Ephesians. And so Paul was a rabbi who stayed a rabbi, uh, but became a rabbi who gave his allegiance to Jesus as Israel's Messiah. And before that, he had been a uh, a persecutor, and even conspired in the murder of followers of Jesus, because he thought the whole movement was so screwed up. But then he had this radical event that transformed him from a persecutor of this Jesus movement into a, a herald and a proclaimer of it. And look at how Paul identifies himself. He's writing a group of people he hasn't met before, and he, does, he actually does what uh, a lot of us do. Um, when you first meet somebody, or you introduce yourself to somebody, you say, oh, like, hi, I'm Paul. And what's the safest question you can ask somebody right after you meet them. What do you do for a living, right? And so, which is actually kind of screwed up, if you think about it, right? Because what you're communicating is like the most important thing I could know about you right now upon first meeting you is your real identity, which is what you do during your work day, right? So anyway, so that, so Paul, uh, however, does identify himself in terms of his vocation, his calling, that he's been called to become this herald and his whole life is dedicated and set apart for this one purpose, and that is to be an announcer of the, the good news or, or the gospel. And so what Paul's going to do in this letter is explore the, the basic story and all of the implications of this message, right, the good, the good news. And for, for Paul and the whole New Testament, for the scriptures, and for a Christian, the gospel is not just, you know, offering an, another way to think about spirituality. It's not... It's not advice, it's not, here's a way that you could become a good person, something like that. The gospel is an announcement. It's an announcement of something that has happened, connected to a person, a historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, and something that he did and that happened in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. And this announcement demands a response. When you hear this response, you can't just respond to be like, oh, that's interesting, or whatever. It actually, the story itself demands that you do something with it. Either ignore it, or refuse it, or respond to it in some, in some way. That's what good news is. It's an announcement about something that has happened. And he goes on to explore and really summarize what is the gospel, at least, and he's going to explore it in much more detail in the chapters that follow. But in the next two sentences, look at how he summarizes it. And actually, we're just going to have it up here on the screen 
and I'll, and I'll read from that. So he says, this is the good news that, that's from God. He says, it was proclaimed through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures that are about his son, who was born from the line of David, according to his family lineage, the son who was declared to be the son of God with power, according to the Holy Spirit, through his resurrection from the dead. And then he names this son with three different names right here, Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah, the King of Israel, our Lord, the Lord of all nations and of the heavens and of the earth. Amen? And amen. So this is a really majestic summary unfolding everything that he's, he's about to say here. And the good news is about this person, Jesus of Nazareth, and it's about a story that leads up to him and to his life and his death and his, his resurrection. And it's all connected to the fact that he's not just some random guy who comes out of nowhere. To understand the good news, you need to understand the story that leads up to him and what, and what actually happened. And so th this has always been interesting to me. When I became a follower of Jesus as, as a young man, the, it raised a question for me, which is, OK, so here's, here's a guy 2,000 years ago on the other side of the planet. He lived. He died. And it's, the claim is that he rose again from the dead. Now, that's pretty remarkable, you know, that something like that would happen in our world. But what, what about that event? There are a lot of re remarkable events in human history, you know? What is it about that person and that event that constitutes an announcement of good news that demands the attention and a response from every human everywhere? Because that is the claim right, right here. And so what, what is Paul explaining here? Why is this of relevance to every single human being? And he begins in a few places. He says, it's proclaimed through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And what he's summarizing there is a storyline. His point is that whatever happened with, with Jesus, you know, here, if you've been raised around the church or whatever, you're just like, oh yeah, the good news. It's about Jesus and he died for my sins and he was raised and so on. If you haven't grown up around the church, you know, and if you, you know, you just don't know any of this. So some guy 2,000 years ago died of claim he was raised and I'm supposed to do something about that? You know, <laughs> like, it just doesn't connect. Like what's, how does it follow? And Paul says, here's how it all comes together. To really grasp why this man's life, death, and resurrection matters for you, desperately matters for you and I and every other person in the planet right now, he says it's first of all that it begins with the story in the, in the Holy Scriptures. Now, we've done this a few times already in this series. To understand Jesus, you need to understand the story that flows up to him. And so, come on, let's just do it again. Come on, <laughs> right? Humor me, right? Or don't humor me. I think we'll learn something. So, so this is the story that, that Israel Scriptures, when he means the prophets of the Holy Scriptures, he's talking about the, the Hebrew Bible or what Christians call the Old Testament Scriptures. And they tell a story where Jesus and what happened with him is the good news that's the climactic event. And so Israel Scriptures, here's what's interesting. The, the Israel Scriptures, the Old Testament, um, it doesn't begin with Israel. It actually begins with the story of all, of all humanity. And humans are, end up here because of the love and the creativity of Israel's God, who is, who is the creator. And as Jesus reveals God to be, as this eternal community of the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, who from eternity past have been others centered in self-giving love and honoring one another. And creation in the world that you and I find ourselves in is the outflow of their generous creative love. And these human beings, they're made to reflect in the image of this creator, and they're made to reflect the creator's goodness. We're, we're earthlings, we come from the earth, but we also have this amazing capacity for relationship and for covenant and love and compassion and, and kindness. And so what the, the purpose, the point is that the humans are made with a purpose. And that purpose is to both know and be received by the creator's love for me and also to reflect that out towards other human beings. And if you, know, if, you, 
If you recognize, if you believe that there is a purpose in the universe, we're not just molecules bashing into each other randomly, right? So if you really believe there is a purpose, it's so intuitive. You know it has something to do with other human beings and how you treat them, right? And if you don't think that there is a purpose for existence or, or whatever, my guess is that you're probably really bothered by that. So even the absence of a purpose makes you aware that you wish there was one, right? <laughs> Which should raise the whole question, well, maybe there is one and I'm just not choosing to acknowledge it. And so here's what human beings are called to do. They're called to fulfill this purpose of mirroring this other-centered love back uh, into the creation and towards other human beings. How's that one going for you? <laughs> Just complete other-centeredness, self-giving, love, generosity, compassion towards your fellow human beings. How's that going, going for you? <laughs> right? So, right. Yeah, exactly. So. It's not going good for me, and it hasn't been for a long time, <laughs> and as far back as I can remember. And so we laugh at, we laugh about that, but it's, it's true. And so the, the scripture's evaluation, one of the words that the, the scriptures use to describe what's gone wrong with us and how we don't fulfill our, our purpose, um, it's a good religious word. You're probably familiar with it. It's the three-letter word, right? Sin, sin. And uh, whatever, sin might be as ambiguous as God uh, as t at this point. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Here's what uh, this, this word means in, in Israel's scriptures that Paul is referring to right here. Sin, to sin is to, is to fail. The word means to fail to fulfill a purpose. There's a, a, a really great story uh, in Israel's scriptures in the book of Judges. It's about a little cadre of warriors that are slingshot experts, right? Which just some, I'm certain that subculture exists in Portland, you know what I mean? I'm just, I have a hunch, you know, and they have a convention and it's in one room at the Red Lion or something like that, I don't know, so, and, and Josh is the president. <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, so they're uh, sin and failure. So they're slingshot experts and there's this little line about them that says, these guys were so awesome and they were so skilled that they could, you know, put a stone in their sling and sling the stone and it says they could sling it as something as small and thin as a human hair and it says, and they would sling their stone and never sin. It's the word. It's the word that's used. In other words, it can be used in a non-religious way in the Hebrew language, and it just means to, to fail, <laughs> to fail to do what you are purposed to do. And this is the diagnosis, one of the diagnoses uh, that the scriptures give of the human condition, is that we're, we've, we're, we're failed. <laughs> we're a failed project. We, we're, we don't fulfill what we're purposed to do. And in the scripture's vision, what we're purposed to do is both to receive the creator God's generous love and to reflect that out towards other human beings and towards God. Love God, love human beings who were made in God's image just like you are. It's the two great commandments as, as Jesus summed them up. And so we're, we're, we're failed. And we fail in all kinds of ways, right? I fail. I'm a failed human being. Surprise, right? So, so, and so are you. And we fail in all kinds of ways. We fail in the things that we do, that we do right? So I have all kinds of, of impulses and motivations and desires, and I end up thinking things or saying things and doing things that I, I'm not just not proud of them, I'm ashamed of them. And you do these things too. And so we fail by what we do, but we also fail by not doing what we know we ought to do. Right? And so there's all kinds of ways that I, are, I know I should express love or generosity and compassion towards other human beings or towards my family or something. And I don't do them. And whatever, I'm lazy, I'm selfish, I haven't had my coffee yet or whatever, you know? And I, so I, I fail in, in both ways. And in the Christian tradition, these are called the, the sins or the failures of commission, the things that I commit, that I do, but also the sins and the failures of omission, the ways that I know I should be a human being, but that I don't because I fail, I choose I, not to, I'm lazy, I'm selfish, or whatever. And so we're, we're failed. We're, we're failed human beings. That's... That's how the story of Israel's scriptures begins. And it gets even more complicated because, of course, my own sin and failures never stay just within the boundaries of my own life, right? And neither do yours. So let's say you have, 
You know, you have like angry, neglectful dad right here. And, you know, is his failures and his deep character flaws and failures, are those only affecting his, his like experience on planet Earth right here? No, our failures spill over into other people's lives. And so that's going to affect, you know, however many children are in this situation. That's going to affect spouse and maybe this, this is the first, second, and third spouse and so on. And that's all going to create wreckage here too. And then that's going to begin this chain reaction of, of failures and like habits that these all pick up from so-and-so. And then all of a sudden it's like this cascade. And this is this is the way the Bible tells the story. As you go out from, from the garden story, it's that humans just keep giving in and keep failing, and these pass on and compound in this whole big chain reaction right here. And it's the sticky web of human sin and failure, and none of us, none of us have escaped from it. And if you think that you have, you're in the height of denial. It's just like, go talk to your roommates about it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're, they're fully aware of your failure as a human being. I might have just broke a little piece of something. I'm not sure. So that was a f failed move on my part. <laughs> okay. I'm not going uh, to think about that. So, so that's how Israel's story begins. So here's, here's how the story goes, then, as God chooses one man a guy named Abraham, and says, I'm going to bring and create out of you a, a family, a distinct, holy, separate family. Uh, God says he's, he's going to come dwell among them personally. He's going to invite them into his presence and give them his special written will and instruction so that they can at least become the kinds of human beings as a light to the nations and so on. And how does this, how do they do? How do these humans do? Yeah, I mean, and it's not a surprise to us, of course, because they're humans, right? And so they have inherited and perpetuate all of the failures that the rest of humanity does and so on. And so then God chooses one particular man out of Israel's family, a guy named David. And he says, from you, David, is going to come a line of kings, and there's going to come one particular human king who's going to act in, in righteousness and in justice, and he's going to save those who are oppressed and bring a kingdom that's going to last forever and ever. And, and how does David do as a human being? I mean, we're talking deep character flaws, right? So, right? so murder, right? And, and, and adultery. And, and so he's clearly got this thing going on, and so do all of his sons, who do even worse than he did, if that were possible. And, and there you go. There you go. That's, that's the story. That's the message proclaimed through the prophetic holy scriptures. And so what Paul is saying is this story was always meant to point forward and to show the human need for someone who can be the kind of human being that none of us are capable of being. And Paul says, that guy is the son. It's Jesus. Because remember, he was born from the line of David that comes from the family of Israel, that comes from all humanity. And he was declared to be the son of God with power, according to the Holy Spirit, through his resurrection from the dead. And the good news, before it gets to Resurrection Sunday, the good news involves these, these crucial hours of, of Passover and of Good Friday, where Jesus comes in his words and in his deeds claiming to be Israel's creator and redeemer God, come to be the kind of human that we are incapable of being. And his whole life reflects other-centeredness and self-giving love. And he talks about the love that the Father has towards him and the love he has towards the Father communicated in the Spirit. And he's come to join deity and humanity in one covenant relationship. And so Jesus, in the, in the Passover meal that he celebrates right before Good Friday with his closest followers, he told them exactly what was about to happen. He was going to, he was going to give his life as a ransom for many. He was going to, as in his own words, give his life as a ransom. It was as if Jesus saw the whole collective history of the failure and sin of humanity just rushing towards him that night. And he intentionally chose to step in front of this, this rushing train wreck of human history and sin and allow it to crush him. That was his claim. And so... What we celebrated on Good Friday in the cross 
is this moment where if this story is true, Jesus is claiming to, to step in the way, to die in, in our place. And that's good news. The death of this Jewish Messiah is good news. Now again, that may seem very strange to you. What does that idea, how does that idea make any sense? Well, this story begins to help you make sense because he claims that he's coming in as the whole of humanity's representative. And that's his claim. And that's what we celebrated on Friday, that's what we remembered, and that's what was reversed in what we're celebrating today. Um, in 1968, there was, uh, uh, there's a neighborhood in northeast Jerusalem, and in uh, 1968 they were uh, clearing ground to um, make way to build some new, some new apartments. And as they were excavating this hillside, uh, they came across, they kind of unearthed this cave. And uh, as they unearthed more of it, they realized, oh, this is like a, a, a human-made cave hewn out. It's, and then they discovered it's a tomb. It was a big family tomb hewed out of the hillside that had become covered up. And um, there were all of these kind of holes in, in the walls and so on with boxes in them. And these boxes were full of bones, human bones. And there was one uh, box, a stone box, um, where the bones in that box made international news just a couple of days later because the box had a, a name inscribed on it. And the name was Yehochanan ben Hakol. Or, or John is how we'd say it in, in English, right? <laughs> Yehochanan, Yehochanan, right? Or uh, Yehoan. So, so they found this guy's bones in this box. And one particular bone is what, is what made all the news because they, they found this ankle bone and, and shattering right through this ankle bone was a huge iron nail. Let me show you a picture just because it's, so, it's just so remarkable and, and horrifying. Right, on the right here, you see the actual bone, and on the left, you see a reconstruction of the, of the foot and where that, where that uh, nail would have been going through. And what they discovered were the bones of a Jewish crucified man. The tomb, the bones, everything dates precisely to the decades around Jesus' lifetime. And what's fascinating, and even it's horrifying is what it is, is look, like, what's wrong with that nail right there? Do you see how it's bent? It's bent right there. And so uh, archaeologists, the best they can surmise is that this guy, Yochanan, was getting, was getting nailed to a large you know, beam or post, as the Romans did, and that it must have hit a knot or something, and the nail didn't penetrate the wood, it just bent in on itself, and dude, you're not getting that thing out of there. And so there's Yochanan with the bent nail in his ankle, and presumably they just had to put in a different one that they eventually pulled out after they after they took him down. That's horrifying. Why is it that this man's public execution by the Romans is good news, but that man's public execution by the Romans is horrifying news? It's one more story of what humans do to each other in violence and in fear, destroying each other. That is the human tragedy. And what makes this man's crucifixion different than that man's crucifixion? And Paul says it's this story leading up to him, but it's also what happened on the third day after he was crucified. And I'll let Josh explore that. So when we hear this story, I don't know about you, but I'm immediately struck with the fact that human history is marked by countless individuals who came with messages that tried to help humanity deal with that word, with sin, with failure. There are countless great men and women who have lived throughout human history who have explored how it is that we can improve our existence uh, and come up with many means, methods, ways of living uh, to help us overcome on some level this failure problem, this sin problem. But none of these great leaders ever, are we told, raised from the dead. 
She says, uniqueness in the gospel. And I would say that there are many, many, many religions and many religions with incredibly helpful ways of living. But there is only one gospel because religion in its essence is humanity's effort to reach the divine in our own self-effort. I just finished reading one of the most profound books I've read in the last couple of years by uh, the, the Jewish rabbi uh, Joshua Abraham Heschel called uh, Man's Pursuit of God, A Philosophy of Religion. And I'm not joking, some of the best content, I think I've used it in the last six sermons I've given, uh, all the way up until the last extremely disappointing chapter. Because Heschel's recommendation for overcoming this problem is greater piety, greater effort on, on dedication and devotion in training the mind to, to cause us to live differently amongst each other. And that's ultimately how he gets at the human dilemma of separation between God and man. And so for us, the question is, is, is how could the, the cross be good news when obviously for the, the foot that we just looked at, it's clearly such horrific news. And, and the reality is this, is that in order for the good news to be truly good news, we have to see and feel in the depths of our being just how bad the bad news is. Because I want to just take this idea of failure further because the Bible doesn't simply declare that mankind fails. We know that. But the failure has accumulated something. It has brought something upon humanity uh, that is terrifying. And that, that the sin, the collective sin of humanity has brought about not merely failure on the individual part, but literally destruction and ultimately death to our world and to our kind. And the scripture declares that failure, yes, it is to miss the mark. And I heard a great illustration uh, that I've used many times by a preacher when I first became a believer that that sin is not so much a measurement of how bad we are. It's not defined by the little things that we do wrong, but it's essentially a measurement of how good we are not. It is us lined up with the perfections of God and where the failure is felt most fully. It's the incredible state in which the human heart, if it was honest with itself, recognizes, as Lady Macbeth did, that we could not withstand close scrutiny. That if you were to truly share with the person next to you all that you were actually thinking, you would not have friends. <laughs> that the depth of our failure goes so deep that it actually breeds death from the inside out. And I love Tim's picture that it just is so interwoven, so, so messy that it's like none of us can escape it. Not the best teacher who has ever lived escaped it because none of them rose from the dead. Because death is the final frontier of sin. Death is. It's the most terrifying reality. In fact, there's a whole book by a famous, uh, famous psychiatrist uh, Beckwith entitled The Denial of Death. And he argues that everything we do as human beings is our attempts at burying the fear of death. Even our love of heroes. Because we want someone to conquer and escape the thing that none of us will escape. And so the outcome of this sinfulness, this missing the mark, it goes deeper than just failure because it's an affront against the holy God. Because God, to be truly good, must be truly righteous, which means his hatred of sin is not his hatred of people. It is his hatred of the thing that robs him of what he has set his heart and his affections upon, which is people. 
That God is love, but he is holy love. And his holy love burns fiercely against everything that is unlovely in the beloved. And you, my friends, are the beloved. But you see, sin's failure is our rebellion against God's sovereign rule as king. It's our attempt to say, I will be my own king, hence we fail. Sin's failure is more than even rebellion against our sovereign king. It is a rejection of God's gracious love, which he, from cover to cover in the Bible, I think sometimes we have this wrong idea that mankind fell and God all of a sudden became an angry God who turned his back on humanity. Man turned his back on God and you have two people that are angry with each other and they're, they're, they refuse to look at That's not what the scripture declares. What we see is that God determined, purposed within himself that human beings alone being made in his image would be his covenant partners in which we would be co-heirs with him, ruling over his creation in fellowship with him forever. That was his intention and that is what he intends to bring about and what we would argue as followers of Jesus has brought about in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because from cover to cover, God doesn't turn his back on sin. What he does is he gets in front of it. But it is we who turn our back on him again and again. So the question that immediately arises is how essential is the resurrection to the Christian faith? And I would argue this, that if our faith is merely a religion, the resurrection actually is not essential. That is, if we want to continue to be nothing more than a failure. Because who could actually even live up to the teachings of Jesus? Have you read them? Someone's like, Jesus was just a great teacher. I'm like, you know what? If he was not the son of God, he was the lamest teacher that ever existed. Because what Jesus demands of humanity is an impossibility. If you don't believe me on that, you simply look at his own teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, which is what brought about my conversion in 1998, when I read the words in which Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, literally the most religious people of the day, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm like, well, that sucks. <laughs> and, then, and then he just goes, and, like, and here, let me just put the nail in the coffin. Therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Oh, okay, thank you, Jesus. I would love to be perfect. And I remember that point, that inner tension in which I wanted to throw my Bible away. But when I read just a little bit further to see that Jesus again and again is actually laying out, he is God's word come to us in human speech. And what he is declaring is God's righteous standard is beyond human capability. Therefore, God in his mercy does something that mankind would never have come up with. Look at all of the religions of the world. Nobody declares God as the one who enters into his own story to become a suffering servant, to get under the brokenness of humanity in spite of the fact that humanity wants nothing to do with him. And he says, I will fulfill my purpose, which is I am not content to exist without mankind for myself. He gets into his own story, and instead of fixing us from the outside in, he comes into the middle of our brokenness. And he lives out this life that none of us could ever live, which alone qualified him for the death that he died. And what we believe is that the death that Jesus died wasn't simply Jesus suffering because of what he claimed about himself. We believe that God himself purposed to take death, sin, brokenness, failure, anxiety, loneliness, hurt, all the pain of human existence. And through the entire life of Jesus, we see Jesus in this incredible act of coming into fallen humanity and instead of falling, he works out in obedience what we only do in disobedience. And then on the cross, it says that he who knew no sin became sin 
on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. And I like that as Tim was teaching, I realized I could replace that word sin in first, it's actually in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter five. I could replace that word with he who knew no failure, Jesus never failed, became failure on my behalf. And it chokes me up to even spit that out because my life is plagued by failure. And it's a failure that has brought upon me and accumulated through my life guilt and shame and indebtedness and the horrifying reality. I remember when I gave my life to Christ was that I could not endure the scrutiny of a holy God's examination, that I was guilty and that I didn't need a teacher, I needed a savior. You see, it is until we come to the place in which we realize in the fullness of our hearts that we cannot satisfy God in our own efforts, nor can we satisfy the longings of our own heart. You know, I've been meditating on this much lately. I am 40 years old. Next month I turn 41. And I finally get what, I never understood what a midlife crisis was. I'm like, what is a midlife crisis? I remember when my grandfather had one and it was defined by a perm, a red sports car and a tattoo of a bunny rabbit on his hand. <laughs> Side note, how come perms are the only thing that hasn't come back from the 80s? <laughs> well, I've been growing my hair back so that next week, you're gonna see me transformed into Kirk Cameron. <laughs> Remember that show? Sweet, just a tight perm. <laughs> you know what, what's sick is some of you would be like, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> but I think of this, what is a midlife crisis? Why, would people, why do we do dumb things? Last year from when I turned 40, I'm like, I, dang it, I'm gonna get a tattoo of a fox on the side of my neck, that's a good idea. <laughs> And it, I, I'm really, I'm like, I'm gonna buy a fast motorcycle. And it's, what it is, is it's that the midlife crisis is the crisis of human identity in the recognition that everything I have given myself to ultimately has brought, not brought ultimate satisfaction. See, it just usually takes you getting old to recognize that everything that you thought would ultimately satisfy your heart will not bring ultimate satisfaction, not even the best things. You think your children will be your ultimate satisfaction? What if they rebel and walk away from you? Someday they'll move out and you won't have them. I've seen families fall apart when they don't have their kids to live for anymore. You think your job will bring you ultimate satisfaction? What about when your boss hires someone more talented than you and you lose your job? You think your health brings ultimate satisfaction? What about my two friends in the last three years, two men at the age of 40, at, I think 43 and 45, both with daughters under the age of 13, die of cancer and lose their health and are whittled away by the most disturbing disease that I've personally witnessed with my own eyes. And, and, and they will never see, they never will see their daughters married or walk down or, or, or see them graduate or enter into the successes or failures of life. They will never continue in their careers that they gave themselves to, one a teacher, one a doctor, but they were confronted with the horrifying reality that sin not only affected our, our hearts, but it, it says in the scriptures that it actually, all of creation groans in a desire from redemption from the brokenness that has entered into it. And what brings satisfaction then? You see, I don't need a good teacher and I don't think you do either. I need a savior who can save me, then teach me. I need someone that actually can get into my pain, take my guilt, my brokenness, and the judgment that I deserve because in Jesus we have both the sovereign judge who is willing to become the judged on your behalf. In Jesus we have the suffering servant who identifies with your most broken part, your glitchiest part of your being. He says, I understand and I know and I care. And what the bad news brings us to, this bad news that God 
the holy God who is without failure. He, he had to become failure. That's how broken we were. The question arises again and again, how much does God love us? Well, according to the scripture, he loves us more than he loves himself because he gave up the most dear thing to him. The father gave up the eternal son to stand in the gap for people that didn't want anything to do with him. But you see what the gospel declares and the reason it's good news and not good advice is it's not, it doesn't even matter what you think about it or whether you speculate upon its, its authenticity. The scripture declares that when Jesus Christ died on your behalf, your brokenness was absorbed into his heart. His heart broke for yours. He tasted hell, separation from God so that you could be reconnected to him. And he declared something that you actually don't have any right to determine otherwise. And that is because of Jesus's death, life died, but then life could not be held by death and his conquering of death and his resurrection declared to be the son of God with power according to the Holy Spirit through the resurrection from the dead is that that was the father's stamp of approval on the son's atoning work. Son, you did not fail. And how did you not fail? By becoming a failure on behalf of a humanity that is failed, but I love. I accept your sacrifice. And what does it mean for us? Hope that death no longer will be the final say in our lives. Because I watched my two brothers who died enter into that unknown reality with the calm confidence that though I may breathe my last here, this is merely the beginning of a story that literally never ends, not the 80s movie. I'm talking a never ending story <laughs> of goodness. For to believe in this message, that death did not keep Jesus, tells us that he did more than just identify himself with us. But he became what Athanasius states, the great church father who declared that in Jesus we have the sweet exchange. Christ dying as if he had lived our condemned life. So that we could live fully as if we had lived his righteous one. You want to live, you've got to die with Jesus to the lie of who God never intended you to be so that Jesus alone can resurrect you into the newness of life. See, to believe this message, it's good news because to believe this message is to believe that I am not alone that God has entered into the brokenness of our world in such a way that there is now, through Jesus, salvation for every lost condition. Only he can satisfy the longing of the heart. Only he can deal with the brokenness of our lives. Only he can make all things new. And I promise you that that event in history is now an eternal active event forever for us. And this is why we don't worship a God who is dead. Nietzsche was wrong. We worship the living God who is alive for us forever. As Paul uh, concludes his little summary of the gospel and he moves he moves forward, you can see this is, this is such a grand claim. And it's a claim that, that forces every one of us to respond in some way. And it's very easy to see this claim. I mean, this is a grand story about all humanity and nations. It focuses in on Jesus. And God's entire purpose was never that the story end right here. God's purpose is that this grand story for all humanity opens back out that as Jesus is declared to be the Son of God, according to the power of God's Spirit, the Father raises the Son through the loving power of the Spirit to declare Him to be the Son of God, and His purpose was always to create a new human family of sons and daughters of God who turn to faith 
in Jesus, their Messiah, their Lord, and find his same victory over sin and over death to be transforming them. And what it means to be a part of this family, it's, <laughs> it's mystical, but it's also actually not that com complicated. Because in a little statement that Paul makes later on in, in the letter to the Romans, he also talks about the resurrection that's available to us through the same spirit. He says it right here in Romans chapter 8. He says, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead, if he dwells in you, then the one who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who is in you. God the Father sends the Spirit in love and in creative life to rescue and transform and heal the death that the Son of God took for us. And the Spirit is, is the expression of God's presence that is everywhere, available to every person all of the time. The Spirit is the member of the Father, Son, and Spirit who is perpetually with speaking to us, speaking truth and convicting to us and mediating God's love to us. And so what Paul is saying right here is this is not simply an ancient event that's just good news for all of us. This is a message that demands a response from every single one of us to call to come and die, as Bonhoeffer said. And it's very simple. It's really simple. It's just acknowledging the fact that this story tells the truth about me. I mean, what do you and I really have to gain from not owning up to this truth about ourselves? You know what I mean? So your benefit, your, your roommates totally stand to gain from this, right? Because they're actually like, finally, they recognize how screwed up they are, right? So, I mean, like, what do you have to lose? Your pride? Come, get off it. You know what I'm saying? Really, your pride is going to keep you from owning the truth about who you know you are. And the moment that we come to that low point of recognizing like the cross wasn't just some moment that happened in ancient history, it was for me. Like I need this to happen because of the kind of person that I am. That's why this happened. That's what the story claims. And the moment that I'm just willing to own that and in whatever mystical existential way you want to talk about it, just grab on to Jesus for dear life, that he's, he's all you got going for you. That's it. Like, what do you and I really have going for us? Look at human history, you guys. Look at your life. What do we have going for us, really? And the good news is this announcement is that we have one person who is eternally and perpetually for us, and we can point to this event of his self-giving love for you and for me. And that person is eternally available to you and I as we're called to come and die with him on the cross and allow the presence, the same spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same personal presence of the creator God who wants to take up residence in your life. And if the, just grabbing onto Jesus for dear life and he says, the moment that the presence of, of the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead takes up residence in your life, all of a sudden, Jesus' future becomes your future. And whether that's the, the moment of the grave that you look towards with fear, or whether it's the, the, the hundred thousand small moments of failure that lay between you and the grave, and for every single one of those, it's the cross and the resurrection declares that those do not get the last word in your life. The grave did not get the last word in Jesus' life, and it will not get the last word in yours if you wrap your arms in faith around Jesus. And what it also means is that it means that your addiction, it means that your divorce, it means that your self-hatred and your eating disorder and the fact that you can't stop watching porn and it means your anger problem. It means all of these things, they're destroying you, but at the same time, if you're just hanging on to Jesus for dear life and faith, it means those things do not define who you are. Those things are not your identity. There is one person and one truth that defines your future and your identity. And it's the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and is giving life to my dead mortal body. Amen? Amen? Are you going to respond? The gospel calls us to respond. And so Tim and I, we're passionate about this. It's why we do what we do. Because 
we believe fervently or we would not stand before you week after week and tell you otherwise. We believe that this Jesus has the power to not only shape your future eternity, but we believe that Jesus has the power to shape your present. And you may be sitting there asking, are you saying to us that Jesus has victory over death and over sin and over brokenness? There was this work on the cross, then why is the world still plagued with so much brokenness and sin? And why do I still often struggle and even believing? And why are, these, why are all these elements of doubt and, and things coming into my life and hindering me? And I think that it's essential that we understand the elements that are involved. There is a pow powerful passage that I want you to just take into your heart today and it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in which Paul spends an entire chapter declaring the importance of the resurrection. He says, hey, listen, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we're still in our sin, we're still in our failure and we are the most pathetic people who have ever lived. He says, but if Jesus rose from the dead, which he did, and is the witness of the scriptures, then something radical has happened and this is where I think was one of the passages that really carried both of my dear friends who, who passed and gave them the confidence to face the final frontier of physical death, was believing the words of the scriptures, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our King. Jesus, our God, our representative, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, and I love this, Paul ends with this strange, instead of focusing on the resurrection, he says the outcome of the resurrection should affect your present state. He says, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In other words, the resurrection is not only the future hope of an existence with Christ face to face, and it is true that the church has lost sight of the promise that if we believe that Jesus really was the Son of God and that he really died for the sins of the world and he really rose from the dead, then we can trust the rest of Scripture, which Jesus tells us that he will come again and restore everything that is wrong with what we see and make all things new. And yet we're also told that if anybody be in Christ, all things are new. So what's the, what's the deal? Why is there still darkness? Why is there still pain? Why is there still war? How do I have this confidence? And this is the reality for us. We live in an age of grace in which we are motivated by our confidence that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe it because he has given us his spirit. We believe he's coming back, but we are grateful that he has waited only because of his tremendous love to give people whom he died for and resurrected from the grave for that they would have the opportunity to respond to that gospel. For the gospel sets us free to say yes to God's yes through Jesus on our behalf. It's not about you guys making decisions for Jesus. It's about you saying yes to the decision that God has already made about you in Jesus. And what do we do with the pain of the world? You know, I've, I've been falling apart, guys. I, I functioned on adrenaline for a half a year and discovered that the limitations of my own body. And this week, I broke out in one of my, the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. I got shingles, lovely, it's wonderful, really. I'd like to hold all of your babies after the service. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm gonna show you right now, I'm just joking, I'm not gonna show you. It's so painful. <laughs> right now, it's really painful. <laughs> and I'm reminded of my own frailty that though the outward man is perishing, why, God, why? I thought you died for all these things. Why do I have shingles? It's like leprosy. I'm unclean. Do I need to wear a sign that says unclean? Uh, and I was, someone found out that I was hurting and they put this on my car last night. I don't know who it is. If one of you. Thank you. Corey Tenboom's book, Don't Wrestle, Just Nestle. Okay? 
I'm like, but nobody wants to nestle me right now because I'm unclean. <laughs> I'm like, I have an ugly rash on me. My, my wife saw it. And she's like, ooh, ooh. You're going to sleep in this bed tonight? I'm like, I'll wear a, a sealed, hermetically sealed suit. She's like, you leaned into me last night in my sleep and it freaked me out. I'm like, it's not contagious. It's just chicken pox. Uh, anxieties. As much as Corey Tenboom, she can write this book. Remember, she was imprisoned by the Nazis. She saw her own sister and father killed by an evil regime that could have caused her to question, is Jesus Victor? But instead, she writes at the end of her life as a really, really old woman. Don't wrestle, just nestle. And it's true that we take these spiritual truths and turn them into really bad bumper stickers, but in a novel I just read, every cliche is a cliche because there's profound truth in it. And let's just replace that nestle, because I think that would be helpful with, don't wrestle with God's love and work on your behalf, but accept it. And you do it by pushing into Jesus, as Tim said. And I would encourage you today, don't be discouraged by what you see in the world around you. This is the interim. It's the beginning of a new age, which began 2,000 years ago, because the moment Jesus rose from the dead, all things became new. And I want to just leave you with this quote from Karl Barth, which has encouraged me so much. And then I want to call you to respond to the decision that God has already made about you in Jesus. Because here's the thing, guys, no one is escaping the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. It says, every knee shall bow. We can either accept his gracious offer and love and, and surrender ourselves to him and accept him as savior, or we can experience him as judge, but we will never escape him, not one person who has ever lived as Lord, as Lord. He is the Lord of all things. God has eradicated your ability to be your own judge. It's no longer possible. All judgment is wrapped up in Jesus. You're left with nowhere to go but up, really. And so here is Bart's explanation, one of my favorite books ever written outside of the Bible, Dogmatics and Outline. I've outlined it so many times that it's uh, almost not readable. But Bart says this, and he, and he gave this in 1948, a lecture in Germany in the ruins of a seminary that had been destroyed by the Nazis. And he says, the Easter message tells us that our enemies sin, the curse and death are beaten. Ultimately, they can no longer start mischief. They still behave as though the game were not decided, the battle not fought. We must still reckon with them, but fundamentally we must cease to fear them anymore. If you have heard the Easter message, you can no longer run around with a tragic face and lead the humorless existence of a man or a woman who has no hope. One thing still holds, and only this one thing is really serious, that Jesus is the victor. Let's pray.